Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are here once again to bring to you Ask Who Damir host Fuad Muhammad. And as usual, we are privileged to be in the company of Dr. Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan, Fuad. Wayak. Just a reminder of our telephone numbers 0022385552482449, to or you can send us an email at ask, that's ASK, at huda.tv. Doctor, we begin our question from Sister Mariam from the UAE, and she's asking about a therapy called crystal healing. And she said that it is used in form of, an, of alternative medicine. And she gave a brief description in which she says that they place different color crystals on different parts of the body in order to find the pain. And also they use some Quranic verse in the process. She wants to know if it's permissible. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wal Aqibatu Lil Muttaqeen. Wala Arwana Illa Ala Zalimeen. Wal Salatu Wal Salam Ala Sayyidi Al Awaleen Wal Akhirin. Sayyidina Muhammad Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Salam. Thumma Amma Ba'd. Praise be to Allah alone, we praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show Him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As you've seen last time, I paused and I didn't give an answer because uh, I didn't have a chance to hear of uh, crystal healing before. Yes. And after investigating and making... Uh, my own research, I found that crystal healing is not something that's uh, new. Mm -hmm. Something has been known since the past, oh. and it is uh, some sort of amulets. Mm. And this is one thing which Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had prohibited, <laughs> and Islam came to demolish. Uh, we don't believe in amulets, in talisman, in ta'weed. Uh, the nature of the healing, of crystal healing, is based on that the, the patient would put faith in crystals. Mm. And there is some sort of uh, spiritual healing to the extent that I have even searched some uh, Christian websites. And he said that if the person stopped the treatment with the crystal healing, his spirituality will deteriorate because he's putting his trust in other than God, in, mm -hmm. in other powers other than God. Mm -hmm. This is what's supporting him and bringing new energy to the body part, uh, which has been exposed to the crystals, to certain crystals, and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't matter, matter if even if uh, the, the, the person is using the Quranic verses or other things along with it, but since it is uh, a violation of the Sharia, it should be banned and should be prohibited totally. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man alaqa faqad uh, Anyone who wears a talisman or a ta'wiz has committed the, uh, disbelief and associated others to Allah in worship. In another hadith, he said that Allah did not create any ailment or disease, but He created the proper treatment and remedy for it. So seek remedy and do not seek remedy in what's prohibited. Mm -hmm. So since this is prohibited and it's based on after investigation on some spiritual power that uh, the patient will put trust in and so on and the healer would utilize, then I uh, urge Muslims not to uh, use this kind of medication or healing at all. Okay. And our second question was from Sister Zoya from Canada, and she says, Why are we not allowed to wear the niqab in salah and hajj? And then when some scholars claim that we, it is a must for us to wear. Okay, first of all, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تنتقب المحرمة ولا تلبس القفزين. This hmm. is a hadith, which is a sound hadith with regards to uh, the ihram, the attitude of a woman in a state of ihram. Mm. Similar to a man, a man must do certain things and abstain from doing certain things. Yes. A woman likewise, with, the, with regards to a woman, she must cover the entire body except for the face, yes. which the hadith, according to the divergent meaning, is a very explicit in the regard of if it is not permissible during the state of ihram nor the prior to cover the face, that means outside these two conditions, a woman normally should be covering her face according to the diversion meaning which is a very uh, very well known and strong foundation in the principles of jurisprudence. Mm. Uh, as far as why uh, we said before with regards to the acts of worship we do not wish on Allah's will nor his wisdom. Mm. If he says pray Maghrib three rak'as we don't say why Maghrib only three rak'as while Zuhr four or Isha out loud and Zuhr is secret prayer, we don't recite out loud. Al-ibadat wa tawqifiyya. We take the commands from Allah, uh, the Almighty. Uh, I also wanted to say another very important thing, which is, 
Yes, indeed. While it is uh, restricted to cover the face in the prayers, whether for a male or a female, mm-hmm. and in the ihram, only for the female, it's worth mentioning here that if a woman during the state of ihram happens to be seen by men who are not her related mahram, in this condition she must cover her face. Okay. And this is narrated by Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Same thing according to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on him. If a woman is praying in public mm-hmm. and she's been seen by men, in this condition she's allowed to cover her face because the original status is to be covered. Okay, okay, we have Sister Fawzia from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. You're live on Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa shaykh wa salaik. Wa alaikum assalam, Sister wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I have a question. Okay. I want to know, is it permissible to use black henna? And I want to know the ruling. Okay. 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 Jazakum Allah. Wa jazakum. Wa jazakum. That's Sister Fawzia there from Qatar. Um, Mukhtar from UAE, he said that, can I listen to the Quran and write it in English, meaning transliteration in order to memorize it? Um, I, this question is, uh, is a very interesting one. It shows that uh, uh, either new Muslims or reverts or non-Arab who are struggling to memorize the Quran. So perhaps that would be a mean of encouragement for those who were born Arab and have been blessed by learning how to read and recite the Qur'an, uh, in, uh, to read it frequently, mm-hmm. to recite it, because this is a blessing that many people um, are eager to have and dying to possess. With regards to his question, whether it's permissible to write the sound of the Qur'anic verses in English or Latin letters, the transliteration, in order to be able to memorize it, it is permissible. It's also permissible to uh, read it if you don't know how to read Arabic, to read the transliteration which will enable you to read the Arabic text. But I want to tell you one thing. There is no transliteration on earth which will enable you to recite the Quran properly because there are several letters, as we explain in the program of correct recitation, there are several letters which do not exist in, uh, in, in English, such as the Ha and the Kha and the Ain. So how will you pronounce them? You'll end up mispronouncing them. So I suggest, along with your attempts, serious attempts, and sincere trying to uh, memorize by writing or reading the transliteration, I highly recommend for you to spend some time learning how to read Arabic, studying the Arabic alphabet, and how to put letters and words together and, and read them. And it is not difficult at all. I have had experience with many reverts, with many uh, Americans, who have tried, and uh, I promise, in, in six months, some of them uh, managed to read with Tajweed and have memorized almost Juz Ahamma and so on. In six months, we're talking about perhaps half hour a day, early morning or so. So if you find a private tutor, if you hang around with uh, uh, good people or ask somebody to assist you, then it would be much, much better than memorizing by mispronouncing the words and letters. May Allah grant you success and enable you to memorize his book. I mean, I mean. We have Sister Um Yahya from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. You're live and ask your questions, please. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah. This time, brothers, I'm not calling to ask, but to correct a mistake I made last episode concerning Kitab Allah al-Aziz. That okay. means when praying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give it a zikriya, to all working and supporting Huda. Huwa a'lamu biman ittaqa. Allah no. uh, yes. <laughs> okay, I said yeah. that Allah says, Allah mm. Actually, I mixed parts of two ayahs from two surah and recited them as one. The correction is the following: mm. of Surah Al-Najm. Why Why is from Surah Al-Nisa? Allahumma wa May yeah. Allah bless you all. Allahumma ameen. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. Sister Umiyah here there from Egypt. We have Brother Saeed from the United Kingdom. Assalamu alaikum, brother. You're live and ask your questions, please. Assalamu alaikum to both of you. Wa alaikum assalam. And I'm very grateful for giving us the opportunity to have with the TV here in the UK for the first time. Mashallah. Mashallah. Uh, I've got a question for Sheikh um, regarding uh, children in the masjid. Okay. Uh, recently, I was at a local masjid, 
uh-huh. and where a few children were making some noise in the background while we were doing the salat. Okay. And one of the caretakers of the masjid stood up and um, made a comment that, that uh, he's, he mentioned a hadith about three things that have to be protected from the masjid. And he said one, uh, those who are mentally ill, um, fitna, and children who do not know how to behave in, in, in the masjid. Mm. And mm. I, 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 my feeling is it's very important to have children exposed to the environment in masjid so that they get used to it. And I just wanted to ask the Sheikh about his opinion about the issue of having children uh, in the masjid. Okay. So brother, first your view on uh, Huda TV now uh, live on the screen or uh, on uh, web streaming? Uh, no, this is a Huda TV live on TV on Hotbed. Alhamdulillah wa shukla. Okay, let me answer you quickly. And then I have a comment. First of all, the hadith is not a hadith, okay. which says "Janibu subyanakum," etc. This is not a hadith, so we do not rely on it. Unfortunately, it is very, very common, along with the, so many other hadith, where people put together in order to impose a belief or a tradition or cultural practices. As a matter of fact, there, on the contrary, there are so many hadith in which that we have seen minors at the time of the Prophet ﷺ enter the masjid, not only prayed. But we have Al Hassan, who came and who rode on the back of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his grandson, while he was in state of prostration, and the Prophet peace be upon him prolonged his prostration to the extent that some of the companions thought that he passed away. Then, when he finished, he said he apologized. He said that it was my son who was riding on my back. That's mm-hmm. in the salah. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a sound hadith. Sometimes I begin the prayer and I intend to prolong the recitation, to recite a long surah. Then once I hear the weeping and the cry of an infant, I shorten my prayer, my recitation, in order to have mercy on his mother. So that's in, in the prayer. Um, uh, when he was given the khutbah on Friday, and he saw his granddaughter, Umama, and she was walking and she was being toppled in her long dress. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam descended from the member and he picked her up mm. and he uh, quoted the verse which means indeed your sons, your wealth are but a trial, a, fit, uh, a fitna. And furthermore and furthermore. I always say in every uh, visit I make to the West, whenever I visit an Islamic center, mm-hmm. if I only see a place of prayer, I say you're missing a lot. Oh. Because Alhamdulillah, the Prophet peace be upon him said that he has been given, uh, uh, and the Ummah has been given one quality that no nation before Islam was given, which is yeah. I mean, if we have a basketball court, mm-hmm. can we establish the Jama'ah there? Absolutely, as long as the place is a Tahir. So we need to keep in mind that whenever we construct any Islamic center, mm-hmm. And we have to learn from our neighbors. Why not learn from the churches, how they construct them? Not a problem, from the synagogues. And we have visited them, we've seen them. It is very interesting when I see a room for babysitting. Yes, there is a glass, but it's soundproof. We could see the kids playing. They're in a very safe environment. They have one lady or one person supervising them. While we're having the lecture, while we're having Friday prayer or the potluck or whatever, we can keep an eye on them while we are attentively listening to the speaker or praying Aisha and Taraweeh and so on. We spend very little, but in order to make it convenient for every person. Those who do not bring their children along with them, they're very offended because the kids are missing up the prayers and keep going in and out and slamming the door, etc. We have seen that. So that's why they say this is not a religious. As a matter of fact, Islam is a religion of balance. Yes, we're supposed to bring our children who are at the age of recognizing what's right from what's wrong. Not a child who may urinate or uh, deteriorate the property of the masjid or urinate on the the carpet, as you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, a child whom if you ask him to sit down, he will sit down. Stand up next to you, he will stand up next to you. And every parent, if you have a child, you will go all the way by the end of the line and you keep your child next to you by the end of the line, not right behind the imam, etc. I mean, take precautions, train your children and discipline them before you come and reward them for being disciplined while you are uh, in the masjid. And it is the responsibility of the entire community that when you're building the masjid or the Islamic center, make sure that you have a room with a soundproof glass where there is plenty of toys and games so that the kids can have fun. They love to come to the masjid. From day one, it is engraved in their mentality that I love to go to the masjid. 
But the masjid, whenever it's only a musalla, when the speaker is always screaming, 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 what would attract our children and the youth in the West? Masajid and Islamic centers in the West, in Europe and in the States, are not supposed to be a copy of what we have in the mm-hmm. Middle East. I know that I'm going to the masjid in order to pray. We don't have a basketball court or a swimming pool in any masjid in our Muslim countries. Mm. But the masjid from day one, when the Prophet Sallallahu constructed it in Al-Madinah, served as a community hall, as a place for gathering, for partying, for condolence, for planning for uh, war strategies, for receiving the delegations, non-Muslims who sit in the masjid. And there was a place for a sleep, Ahl al-Sufa, who uh, did not have a place, and they would eat there, and men and women would enter the masjid. So we don't want to bring our cultural package with us into the West and say, no, this is a masjid where women are not allowed, so how are they going to learn? No children are allowed, how are they going to learn? How will they learn that they are Muslims and there is a place of worship for them? So uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have enough time to tackle this, but uh, inshallah, perhaps uh, one time we'll talk about how should be the Islamic center, especially in the West. We have Sister Noura from Sudan. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. Your live and ask clear questions, please. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I have two questions. Okay. One on supplication. I heard a few people say before that they are not pious enough to supplicate to Allah for it to be answered. Therefore, they go through pious people, you know, like the imams, uh, to supplicate on their behalf. Is okay. this right? Okay. And then my second question is um, about Sihir. Um, is there such a thing as um, uh, having seven uh, dates from Madinah per day that would help you know, protect against fear or something like that? Okay. Um, that was once told when I was in Mecca. Um, so thank you very much. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. That's the Sunnah there from Sudan. We also have Sister Mariam from the United States of America. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. Your life on Askuda. Your questions, please. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, as Sheikh, I have uh, three questions. Okay. Uh, my first question is regarding I have a daughter who's under two years old, mm-hmm. and while I'm praying, and she always complains in front of me. Mm-hmm. I was wondering if that's like, uh, you know, I'm invalidate my prayer because okay. she's in front of me. Okay. And my second question is regarding I heard about uh, praying two, two, uh, two raka before Asr. Mm-hmm. And there's a hadith regarding that, like, uh, beside the 12 raka you pray during the day. Okay. I, I, want, I want to know if there's anything authentic about that. Yes, okay. And also regarding a woman cutting her hair, very, very short, like, uh, you know, how the men cut her hair. Mm-hmm. She's been advised to grow it back, but she says she don't have no bad intention. And I want to know regarding that there is any shame on her for doing that because there is no valid reason for her to do that. Can you repeat the last question for me, please? Uh, it's regarding cutting her hair. She cut her hair, but okay. she don't have no good reason. She says it's easy for her to take care of her. Okay, okay, okay. Jazakallah yeah. khair, Sister Mariam there from the United States of America. We also have Sister Um Muhammad from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. Alaykum 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 alaykum. Alaykum. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question concerning hanging Tamima. Uh, because I want to ask um, that I'm wearing a necklace with the shape of um, blue eye. Uh, blue eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking into consideration that I'm not hanging it because I want it to protect me or save me. Mm-hmm. Just because I like its color and its shape. Um, um, Muhammad, let me ask a question. Uh, is w- it permissible for me to wear it uh, can, or not? Can you hear me, Um Muhammad? Yes. Okay. Now, normally, why do people wear such necklaces? Um. Okay. I guess you know the answer. And for that reason, because this particular necklace, which has five fingers, a hand, or the blue eye, or whatever, is been used as a talisman, or an amulet, or ta'weez, then Muslims are not allowed to wear it. Even if you say, I have a good intention. I was returning from uh, uh, from Emirates at uh, Dubai Airport. I have seen a young couple, Muslims, mm. and uh, they were wearing a rubber uh, bracelet. Mm-hmm. So I asked him, I was at the, check, uh, at the counter, I said, what is this for? He said, it is to bring a good luck. Uh-huh. And the other one was wearing a necklace, uh, also with beads and so on, two males. I said, what is it? It is to bring a good luck, but my intention is good. I don't believe in it, whatever. But the truth came first when he said, it is... To bring a good luck. 
okay, in uh-huh. Arabic, حظاظة, uh-huh. to bring a good luck. I said, you know that if you're wearing such thing, mm-hmm. that your prayer will not be accepted. How could you believe in a piece of rubber mm-hmm. to bring you a good luck? Mm-hmm. And you claim that you believe in the oneness of Allah and His preordainment, His divine destiny, and that He is al-darru and nafa Yes. How could you? So he turned around and said, well, I know, but I don't really believe in it. I understand. But look, these are all false excuses. Wearing uh, an adornment, whether a necklace or a bracelet for women is permissible. There is no problem with that. But, مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ If you try to emulate and imitate certain people, your intention is different. But when people say the same thing, brothers and sisters, I really thank you, Muhammad, for calling in right now. I see some people who are supposed to be religiously committed, hanging from their front mirror, mm. uh, this talisman. They know the, the blue eye, especially amongst the Arab, yes. it is uh, to repel the evil and the evil eye. Mm. Or they hang a horseshoe. So what is the purpose of hanging such thing? It is known that hanging the horseshoe or the blue eye or the hand, the palm with five fingers, supposedly people believe in it. Those who believe in it, it mm-hmm. would uh, uh, repel the evil eye, block the hasad and the ayn and so on. So, no, you're not, so, you're not supposed to wear it and it is not permissible. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We have Sister Zahra from Egypt. Salaamu alaikum, Sister. Your life and ask her. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I just want to ask two questions. To okay. Me, which the first question is, um, my sister passed away. And okay. She left four children, which is very small. And I know, and I see the hadith where the Yatim children, if you help them, Allah will give you a lot of sawab. Mm-hmm. So um, I was wondering, the Yatim is only the children who their fathers passed away, or the mothers passed away as well? Okay, okay. excellent. Okay. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, the second question is Salat al-Fajr. Mm-hmm. I've, been, I've been to Somalia, and Salat al-Fajr, I get confused, because they make three adhan. Three? Three adhan, okay. right? I just... Confused, I said, which is the first should I pray? Did you try to ask what is the third adhan for? Or which which adhan is the fajr adhan? Yes, that's what I want to know. Oh, I, I don't know personally. Maybe you can consult another uh, brother who's from Somalia. Inshallah, we'll find out. Okay. Jazakallah khair, sister Zahra there from Egypt. Um, Umm Abdul Rahman from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia she said she had several dreams that became reality and she wants to know what's your opinion about this. Okay, before I answer uh, this question about uh, dream issue, mm-hmm. I want to uh, deliver the glad tidings and the good news to the viewers. Subhanallah, mm-hmm. with the financial dilemma that the channel is going through, yes. we have somebody who sponsored the channel to be aired directly on Hotbird. And uh, this is the fruit. So I want to thank this person because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, uh, "Whoever does not thank people does not thank Allah the Almighty. If you're not grateful to people for their good doing to you, then you're not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa taala. And the best mean to thank any person for doing you anything that you cannot afford to thank him materially is mm-hmm. to say, Jazak Allahu khairan. So may Allah bless this person and his family. And also, I'd like to pray and thank all the brothers and sisters who called in to support and sponsor programs." And the best, the best comment and remark to that is the prophetic statement in this regard, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Adal wa ala al-khairi lahu adru fa'ale." So for every person who watches goodness, listens to uh, the khair, to the Quranic guidance, to the Sunnah, whether a non-Muslim accepts Islam, whether a Muslim by name came back to his or her senses and started practicing the religious duties. Whether a practicing Muslim that he was indulged into some particular mistake and he realized through the programs that it is right or wrong and so on. Any guidance that will introduce to people, you are a partner in that. You are a partner in that. Without diminishing the word of either one of us. May Allah grant all of us sincerity. So I highly encourage everybody to seek a share of this goodness. It is for everybody. As I said before, this is one of the best forms of jihad, of legitimate and permissible jihad nowadays. May Allah accept, and I'm very, very pleased to hear callers uh, from Europe watching us live, as well as, by the way, that uh, um, as far as I know, that uh, Huda TV has been aired live also on uh, um, uh, Time Warner uh, to North America as well. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread His word all over the universe. 
Now with regards to dreams, the sister said that Okay, just before you tackle the question, okay. can we take uh, Sister Umm Ruqayya from Nigeria? Assalamu alaikum, sister. If you're live and ask for them. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have two questions. Okay. My first question is about Salat al Qasr. That is traveler's prayer. Okay. Salat al Qasr. When somebody travels to. Hello? Yes, go ahead, sister. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, sister. Uh, about Salat al Qasr. Mm. Traveler's prayer. Okay. Um, when, somebody, when somebody travels to another uh, town, mm. is he supposed to. to, to to two two that is for more than three days if he is going to stay for more than three days. Okay. Uh, and when he is uh, living outside his uh, hometown. Okay. Is he supposed is he supposed to pray us through prayer when he go to when he when he visited his hometown? Okay, I understand the sister Rukaya. And my Umafana. second and my second question is about uh, reading loudly in prayer about uh, women. Okay. Can women pray? Can women uh, read loudly like men? Or okay. They can't. Okay, got it. Thank Sister Umm Ruqayya there from Nigeria. Jazakallah khair. We also have Umm Yasir from the UAE. Assalamu alaikum, sister. You're live on Ask your questions, please. Wa alaikum salam, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Muhammad. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, actually, I'm in uh, uh, deep uh, confusion. I don't know what to do. Actually, I had my periods uh, last month on the 26th. Mm -hmm. So I completed on the seventh day and I had my ghusl. I finished. And then I was uh, uh, saying my prayers regularly. Then after that, on the 13th day of my period, that I didn't get any spotting or like that. But on the 13th day of, uh, of the date when it started from 26, I noted some kind of um, blood. But it was fresh blood. It was not dark uh, in color. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it was in uh, red color. So what I did was I just cleaned myself and I said my prayers. I was saying my prayers until yesterday. So today morning uh, I noticed and then again it was the same uh, thing. So today uh, when I counted from my days from 26, so today is the 17th day. Mm. So I was a little bit confused whether I should say my prayers or not. So from today morning I have not prayed since it was the 17th day. So what should I do? Uh, um, um, yes sir, in brief because this is related to the prayer so I, I gotta answer you immediately. Uh, yes. As long as it is not the time of your regular menses, nor is it the same physical characteristics of uh, the bleeding, then that's considered as a regular bleeding which does not prevent a woman from praying, nor fasting, nor reading, or touching the Qur'an. You will be only required to perform an independent wudu for each prayer once its time entered. And with this wudu, you can pray the fad and all the related nawafil and other sunan as much as you want, even though there is a blood flow. Okay? Then whenever the prayer of the next time approaches, once it enters, you will be required to perform a new wudu. If there is any um, uh, contaminations against one's clothes with impurities, with such case, then also the tahara or the purity of one's clothes or the um, underclothes uh, are a must. Then perform a new wudu for the next prayer and pray along with it all the related nawafil. And there is no burden on you. We have Brother Fasih from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. You're live on Ask Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam. Dr. Salah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, Fasih. How are you? Alhamdulillah. How old are um, you now? Um, I'm going to be 15, inshallah. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the question is on the behalf of my mother. And she was reading um, Surah uh, Karya. And on uh, with, as a note to the last ayah, that is, Vanarun Hamia. Um, there was a note given, it says that it was a hadith that um, Jahannam complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a part of it was eating another part of it uh, and it was getting heated up and it asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give it two breaths and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted it two breaths and Prophet sallallahu said that when it's intensely cold then it is the cold breath of Jahannam and you must heat up your prayers and if it's too heated it is the hot breath of Jahannam and you must cold your prayers. I mean, pray in a cool place. So is it really a hadith or is, is it a fabrication? That's my only question. Jazakallah mm -hmm. khair. It is a hadith. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, we have Brother Sayyid from Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, brother. You're live and ask all your questions, please. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. 
Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyid, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, thank you for asking. What's your question? Uh, Sheikh, I have a question regarding the Jummah Khutbah. Mm-hmm. During in the Jummah Khutbah, the Khatib sits on the pulp for a short while in between the two Khutbahs. Mm-hmm. Is it permissible to have a short dua during this time? Well, can you repeat the question, Brother Sayyid? During the Juma Khutbah, mm-hmm. the Khatib sits on the pulpit for a short while in between the two Khutbahs. Okay. So is it permissible for us to offer a short dua during this time? Oh, okay, okay. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Brother Sayyid, they are from Qatar. We also have Brother Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. You're live on Ask with your questions, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh. I am going to say one hadith in part and I would like to ask you whether it is a sound hadith and give me a full text of hadith if it is sound hadith. Inshallah. Mm-hmm. Okay. The hadith Qalam Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Yushiku an yatiya ala nasi zamanun la yabqa min al-islam illa ismuhu wa la yabqa min al-qurani illa rasmuhu. Okay. okay. Masajiduhum wa hiya kharabun min al huda. Can you complete this hadith and Inshallah. let me know the reference also, please? Okay. Alright, okay. thank you very much. Okay. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. We have also Brother Sulaiman from Nigeria. Salaam alaikum, Brother. You live and ask other questions, please. I think we just. Brother Suleiman there from Nigeria. We'll take a short break here on Ask Hudan. We'll be back right after this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The deeds are bound by its intentions. The deeds that we do, we have to have a sincere intentions that we're doing it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the best definitions of things, the right vision, the criteria in which we would get to know what is right and what is wrong through the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet The tafsir of the Qur'an is to explain, is to interpret the best words, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. were in vain because of ignoring or turning away from this great foundation. We see many people coming to the way of truth, following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but later on they get off track. What is the reason behind that? Unity is a result, it's not a cover-up. We have to be united from inside. And Allah made this clear in the Quran when He said, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولِ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Huda. Quick reminder of our telephone numbers 00202 38555 or 249 or you can send us an email at ask that's ask at huda.tv. We have a brother Muhammad from Oman. Assalamu alaikum brother. You're live on Ask Huda. Your questions please. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, I would like to know a question. 
uh, I'm, I'd like to ask a question about the hadith about Khurasan, if it's authentic or not. And can the hadith about Khurasan be the Afghanistan today? Okay. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Brother Muhammad dear from Oman. We also have a brother Abu Anas from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, brother. You live and ask all your questions, please. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah blessed us with the son in, in uh, during the month of Ramadan, and we named him Anas. Mm-hmm. And uh, as per Sunnah, uh, uh, if you get a son, then you need to uh, sacrifice. Okay. Either two sheep or then uh, uh, if you sacrifice a cow, then uh, two parts of cow may be considered as uh, as aqiqa. I just want to have a clarification here. We didn't uh, do his aqiqa uh, just on the seventh day, but we went to Pakistan uh, during the Hajj days, Eid al-Adha, mm-hmm. and uh, we sacrificed a cow. Uh, one part as as the sacrifice of Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Adha mm-hmm. and uh, two parts with the intention of uh, the aqiqa. doing aqiqa. Mm. So as, is that all right? Okay. Okay. And there is one more question also. If okay. anyone insults Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the way we just come across uh, numerous situations here. I mean, uh, not here in Saudi Arabia, of course, in uh, in, in the Western Europe, particularly. Mm-hmm. So, what what should be the appropriate response? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Zakla khair, dear brother Awanas from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We also have Sister Habiba from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. You live and ask all your questions, please. Yeah. Um, please, I'd like to find out whether it's permissible for a woman to visit the grave site and pray for the deceased. Okay. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Sister Habiba there from Nigeria. I think we have a finally have a chance to answer Sister Um Abdurrahman's question. Okay, about the dream. Uh, first of all, with regards to Fasih's question, the hadith which is mentioned uh, by Ibn Kathir, may Allah be him, in his uh, interpretation of Surah Al Qari'ah concerning the verse Narun Hamiya, it's a sound hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah and it's collected by both Al Bukhari and Muslim. The hadith begins as that the fire said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Akala ba'di ba'da. Uh, that the fire, a part of it have eaten, um, a part of it out of extreme and intense heat of fire. May Allah protect us Ameen. against Ameen. its heat Ameen. and the blazing fire. Uh, the dream. Uh, the sister was saying that she has seen many dreams and they came true. What is the indication of that? Mm-hmm. There is a hadith in this regard. The Prophet ﷺ said, الصادقة, uh, A dream or a night vision which uh, comes true is a part of 46 parts of the prophethood. How? Basically, before the Prophet ﷺ received the first inspiration of wahy or revelation by Jibreel ﷺ, uh, six months before that, the introductions of the prophethood and the risala and the inspiration have started by seeing night visions and it would come as the daybreak. It would come exactly as you've seen it. Oh. Whatever you've seen in his dream, and if he tells people, it would come true. Kafalaq mm-hmm. subh So six months with true night visions. Mm-hmm. The prophethood and the mission of the Prophet ﷺ so, was so. 23 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, how many six months in it? 23 years? 46. 46. Mm-hmm. This is how a ru'ya sadiqa represents one part out of 46 parts of the prophethood. It doesn't mean that you're receiving any wahi or revelation or inspiration. Huh. It has been seized by the death of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu but it's a good sign. It's a good sign. So when you see a good dream, it is very important that to consult somebody who knows, who is a righteous person, consult him concerning the interpretation of dreams, because whatever interpretation will be offered, it would come true. Okay, Jazakallah Khair Sheikh. We have Brother Ahmed from the United Kingdom. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. Yeah, firstly, I congratulate Sheikh Salah. Thank you, Brother. Thank you, Brother. Uh, just one, one question, Brother. I was, I was trying to ask the Sheikh and you as well on the Huda channel as well. 
Mm-hmm. You know, from London, we are in UK. You know, most of the UK, they have Astra. They have uh, Eurobeard 1, which mm-hmm. is 2028 20, East, which mm-hmm. is called Astra 2A or Astra 2B or Astra 2D. Okay. So if, if, if you can put through the channel on Astra 2A or 2B or Astra 2D or Eurobeard 1, because, mm-hmm. you know, most people in the United Kingdom, they have, uh, they have this chart, which is called Eurobeard uh, 28 East. Mm-hmm. Because, mm-hmm. you know, people in here, they have small dishes and they live in mostly in the flat, you know, mm. they can't have hot beer or nails, so it's impossible for them. Okay. So I was, I was just asking, because Suda Sanal is English, isn't it? So more, most people in England, inshallah, more is, is likely, is very benefit for all Muslims in the United Kingdom, so they can benefit from, from Suda Sanal. Okay, inshallah. Khair, Brother Ahmed, I will definitely convey your message, inshallah, to the administration, and we'll see what we can do in this regard. Yeah. I know now with the Sanal, you don't hold there, I know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Just but one another question, Shaykh. Sure. Uh, okay. You know, most people, I know now, uh, is it possible, I mean, could I do Jum'ah prayer mm-hmm. in uh, Jama'ah, in, uh, in, uh, in my workplace with another three people or four people? Mm-hmm. That's all I can do because, you know, obviously I can't, you know, I can't leave my, my, okay. my work, you know. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks. Okay. Wa alaikum as Brother Ahmed there from the UK. Um, her second question was, um, does Allah dis- uh, responds to dua differently with regards to the effort made in making the dua? Uh, yes, of course. Not only with regards to the effort, with regards to several other considerations. Mm-hmm. The hadith, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that not necessarily every dua you make invoking Allah Almighty for whatever you may think it's good that will be delivered immediately because mm-hmm. Allah Almighty says, وَادْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرِّ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ وَكَانَ الْإِنسَانُ عَجُولًا Sometimes, Fuad, we invoke Allah with the, with the maximum strength we have, mm-hmm. with sincere devotion, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, all, all what I need in this life is just to buy this car. This is my dream. Or, oh Allah, give me the son, give me the son, give me the son. He has three, four, five dollars, but he's dying to have the son. Mm. But sometimes you don't know that what you're invoking Allah for may be the main cause of your destruction. Subhanallah. This car is going to be the worst for you. Mm. Or you would die in it. Or this job would divert you from uh, the deen. Or this wife whom you're dying to marry is not befitting for you, it is not your good match, it is not, you, you know, so many reasons. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Yes. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ It may be that you dislike something, while it is good for you. Mm-hmm. And the opposite is also true. You may love something while it is definitely bad for yourselves. Mm-hmm. And Allah knows best and you know none. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whenever a believer makes an invocation, raises his or her hands with sincere devotion and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything, yes, definitely there is a response. But the response will vary according to Allah's will. With Fuad, he knows that the response cannot be delayed. He's in a dilemma. So mm. he needs an immediate assistance. And only Allah can assist him. So mm. the response will be immediate. Oh. And he will deliver the response. It happened in so many incidents and narrations we discussed, such as the three who were been captured in the cave, such as the Prophet uh, Yunus salam, and others and others. And it happens in our today's life. When, uh, when somebody's child falls, he says, Allah Akbar, oh Allah save him. It's, it's a matter of, you need an immediate response. So there could be an immediate response according to Allah's will when he knows that's best for you. Mm-hmm. Or if there is no immediate response, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will utilize this dua, which you have been invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for innocence to buy this particular car, or to be accepted in this particular job, or, or, or. So Allah would utilize this dua in order to repel and prevent the harm that's equivalent, but on the contrary, to the benefit that you're looking for in order to protect you from a harm that was about to befall you. Oh, but I didn't know. You don't have to know. Oh. But your dua was effective. Oh. And the third, that if there is, ne- if there is neither an Im- immediate uh, response, no protection against anything, that the dua will be preserved and saved for you to benefit you on the Day of Judgment, which is definitely the best. So every single believer, once you raise your hands, while you know that you've been eating from halal, 
wearing clothes earned from halal earning, and you say, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, your dua is never wasted. It's definitely answered as long as you do not haste and rush and quit. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We have Brother Abdul Rahman from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. You're live on Ask Khuda. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Hi. Brother, can you just turn the, the volume of your television set down before I ask your question, yes. please? Yes, sir. Uh, I like this yes, uh, yes, uh, channel, Huda. Very good. Brother, can you just turn, turn the, 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 the volume down, please? And, and we love you too, Abdul Rahman. Do you have a question? And we love you too, Abdul Rahman. Okay. Okay, Jazakumullah uh, khairan. Brothers and sisters, the viewers, if I may request you to hold your phone calls for now because we have uh, plenty of backlog, so let, let's answer some of those questions, yes, inshallah. inshallah. Okay, we have Sister Abira from Pakistan. She, she actually called from Pakistan. She says, Are we allowed to donate our organs when we die? For instance, this question needs uh, a series of episodes in order to explain because there are two different views. One which says it is permissible with very strict conditions, and another which says it's totally not permissible. So I would just give some of the reasonings uh, of those who say it is permissible with conditions. What are the conditions? That it is not for any wages or compensation, no material compensation whatsoever. It is just for the sake of saving the life of somebody else, and according to the will of the deceased himself. It will be given to a believer, it will be... Uh, without humiliating the body of the deceased, and it would not be by rushing, rushing, the term, you know, because it's a big trade. Mm -hmm. Even it's coming in the West. There was big scandals some uh, in, in some very advanced and modern countries, mm -hmm. where people who are lying down on life support they will expedite their death by pulling out the life support and the tubes in order to say that they're dead, but the brain is still functioning. Maybe there is a heartbeat or there is not. They rush in order to eliminate or extract certain organs because there is a line of people who are waiting for the, those organs. So that has to be regulated according to the view which says it is permissible. Uh, be given to believers to save life and it is uh, certainly uh, helpful and useful and it would save the life of the recipient. Mm -hmm. Okay? There is a, a series of tests have to be done in order to find out whether there is a compatibility between the recipient and the organ which will be coming from the donor, whether he is alive or dead. And there should not be any money compensation whatsoever, uh, even if it is given to the ears of the dead person. Okay, and we have Brother Ali from the United States asking, is it allowed to delay the prayer seeking knowledge? And he mentioned the hadith or the occasion where Ibn Abbas was giving a lesson and a man stood up and said, Salah, Salah, and he told the man that he knew the sunnah more than him. Well, uh, if, if there is a lecture, for instance, Mm -hmm. If there is a dars, what we need to do is realize that the adhan should be called on time. We do not postpone the adhan an hour later and say that we're sitting in a halqa. No. The adhan will be postponed, uh, uh, the adhan will be called on time. And if the prayer, as long as the congregation is waiting for another 20, 30 minutes, that's still during the best time of the prayer. With regards to Salat al Isha, if it is delayed, there is no problem as long as the congregation is there and they're sitting. As long as that will not approach in the end of the time, uh, nor that would lead to those who are coming to pray would not pray and miss the prayer, and the adhan will be called on time. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. Sheikh, um, we'd like to thank all the viewers who participated in the show today, and for those who still have questions, you can also send them at ask, that's ask at huda.tv. And for all the viewers who would like to support this worthy cause of Ask Huda and Huda TV as a whole, you can send an email at support at huda.tv. Until next time, I leave you with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If my love is attached to thee, then from sins I will be free. Each time my heart will beat, your name will resound with heat. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my
my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test